Hello. Hello. Good to see you, Victor. See you. We saw each other uh, briefly uh, in, in Munich, and your car broke down on the way here. It did. Okay. <laughs> but I made it. Uh, you made it. So uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful to be here. So we're going to cover uh, the information ecosystem and how uh, Victor's side of that equation, AI and a avatars, so touches my side of it, which is reliable information. Um, first, you are you were born into media. You're the son of a media CEO. Um, you have founded a, a, a unicorn, and you're from the happiest country on earth, uh, Denmark. Tell us a little bit about Synthesia, the company that you founded, uh, which has uh, taken off like a rocket. Yes, yeah, so I think the very short story is I, I grew up loving technology, loving science fiction, um, and the kind of I guess the fringes of technology. Uh, and my, my kind of teenage years figured out that I, I like to build digital products. I, I thought that was really fun. After doing that for four or five years, I realized that uh, I wasn't super passionate about building business process tools like bookkeeping, HR, things like that. I had a knack for building something that was a bit more sci-fi. Um, and so almost seven years ago, I moved to London and I met uh, two professors, some of the world leaders in AI. And they'd done some of this sort of first research in using neural networks to actually generate video frames that looked photoreal. And when I saw this technology for the first time, I just felt like it was magic and there was something so captivating about it that I wanted to spend, uh, spend some time exploring that. And eventually that became Synthesia. And the mission we have at Synthesia is actually pretty simple. Um, you know, we want to make it easy for everyone in the world to make video content. But we don't think of that as building smaller, more affordable cameras. We don't think of that as better iPhone apps for editing your videos. We're building technology that eventually is going to enable you to uh, create a Hollywood film without needing any cameras, actors, studios, microphones, anything like that. Which sounds like a crazy idea, but today you can write a book, you can publish it to the world, you can make almost any image in Photoshop, so on and so forth. So that's kind of where the, everything started. And so th that's the future vision to, to do maybe a motion picture uh, just by writing code. Yeah. Uh, but today, even many of your companies might use Victor's technology or something akin to it. Uh, if you have an HR video and an avatar presents that in, in many different languages. And so that's the primary yeah. uh, uh, business that you have right now. And it's an enterprise yes. SaaS business effectively. Exactly. We're an AI video platform, but I'm selling to the enterprise. And really what we help our customers with is turning their text assets into video. So if you're a big fast food chain and you need to train and onboard millions of people every single year, you used to do that with a 40-page manual you have to sit down and read, which is not a great way for either the company or the employee to onboard. Now they can make a video. Our platform works in 140 different languages, so it can be in the language you prefer. And the retention of information is just much higher in video. It's around 80% versus 10% in text. Uh, there's some research around. And AI and generative AI is at the center of that. Yes. So everything we do revolve, today revolves around building these AI avatars or AI actors, mm -hmm. which is essentially sort of a digital human, you could say. It's something that Hollywood has been working on for many, many years. But AI has enabled us to really democratize this and give this to any office worker in a big company who can, who can make videos themselves. Have you made an, an avatar of yourself? I do have an avatar of myself. Yes. Okay, are you it's happy still, with it? Is it is, does it freak you it, out? So uh, I'm uh, I'm not proud to say it, but it's still struggling a little bit with the Danish accent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it works better for people who speak uh, who speak without an accent. But uh, I'm I'm sure we're going to solve that in the next three to six months. Okay, good. <laughs> Would you have an avatar of yourself, mate, ever? Uh, no, uh, probably the world has enough just <laughs> having me in, in flesh. But um, so AI also obviously very important uh, to us. Uh, right now in the publishing industry and the media industry, many of you, of course. Um, uh, top of mind for us is uh, uh, intellectual property rights at this moment. That is uh, 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 top of mind. We're at this moment in media where uh, a lot of content has been absorbed by learning models, and media has given its value away before. Uh, you think when the, when the free media and advertising models came out, destroyed much of media. We have to make sure that the value for reliable information is captured at this very moment. And so we produce a, a reliable and trusted information, mainly for uh, people interested in business. We do that for consumers uh, as well as for uh, large businesses. Uh, we're also working on AI in terms of work, work tools. Uh, we've used uh, some of yours in, internally, um, uh, as well as uh, creating AI and generative AI-driven uh, products. And you'll see that coming out in coming months. Uh, those will be summary-focused uh, type, uh, type, type products. 
So I'm curious, uh, from where you're sitting, and you're, you're selling uh, into uh, enterprises, uh, do you think that net-net uh, AI and generative uh, is going to help or hurt the media industry? I think as with any other big platform shift we've seen in technology, there is tremendous opportunity, but there's also got to be a lot of disruption, right? And so I think um, the, the kind of bit tried answer maybe is that those who are going to be fastest to adopt can make some huge wins. And I think those who are too slow will, will face a lot of competition, both from other media companies, but I actually also think what we're seeing with, with all these technologies, and I would actually include even the internet and the ability for anyone to type something and publish it on the internet, mm. is this democratization, force of democratization, right? Which enables an individual to create more without needing the budget to produce it. Text is free today. Video still comes at a price, but that's going to go to zero marginal cost very quickly. Um, and then, of course, distribution, part of that. So I actually think that when, when I think of generative AI and where the most competition is, is going to come from, I think it's, it's less other media companies. I think it's more prosumers, you know, YouTube creators, who today are, in, in my world, uh, locked to creating content they can record with a camera. They're going to be able to produce content that might rival what a Hollywood studio can do today. And so the, the competition is going to be around eyeballs and attention, right? And I think it's going to come from new places. And, and so uh, what you sell, the solutions that you sell to companies today, like creating avatars that you use for your HR programs or for, yep. for other things, uh, you think that will be democratized to the extent that it will be next to free for, uh, for end users all around the world, consumers? And I think the marginal cost of producing a video in general, you know, not just with our platform, but in general, will go significantly down as we reduce the need for cameras yeah. and we, um, we, uh, we, we are able to synthesize with AI, right? So I think an analog here could be text, whereas if you go back before computers, you'd have to write something on a physical piece of paper and then you have to go to a printing press to actually create a book or a newspaper or something like that, right? Whereas obviously today, the price of doing that, like you can start a blog and publish something, There's the, the production cost is, is going to zero. And I think that's going to happen for, for video as well. But I think the opportunity that presents itself um, in, in the domain that I work in, and, and we spoke a bit about this also uh, earlier today, right, is, is really like taking text-driven type forms of media and making them into video, audio, and some of these formats that we know that especially younger audience prefers to consume. Yeah, so you, you really, so I had to just get my head around this, but you type your video effectively. Yes. Like you just, or maybe you speak your video, yeah. and it will, your words, your script, will turn into images that are realistic, yes. human, humanoid. So basically the way our platform works is that you type out the script of your video, kind of like if you're, like if you're a director, yeah. Then you select one of these AI avatars, or AI actors, which can be from our stock library, or you can create yourself as an AI avatar. And then we essentially create a video of that avatar reading out the script um, to, to the camera, right? That's going to evolve over time so that avatars can do more interesting things than just talking to the camera, walk around the room, have conversations, so on and so forth. But it's really about making it so easy to do that anyone um, in this room will be able to understand how to use it in five minutes which okay. is very different from operating camera and editing it afterwards and so on. And a lot cheaper. And a lot cheaper, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, misinformation is also high on our list. So we uh, live, all live in a world where disinformation, misinformation is becoming so prevalent. Uh, it, that's just with long existing technology being very easy to disseminate. Your technology and, and technology like that will add an, a, a next dimension of that. They're commonly known as deep fakes. Uh, we've all we've all seen this, but the the avatars that you're using are are hyper realistic. Hyper realistic. So, do you think that your technology is going to worsen uh, the problem of misinformation? And so, where do you see the, the worst applications of maybe not your own technology, but technology like it. Yeah. So I think of this uh, problem in two dimensions. One is how do we make sure our technology and our platform is not misused? Um, so we do KYC style checks if you want to make an avatar. We do very heavy content moderation, which means you're not able to create content if it not, doesn't follow our content guidelines. I think for the world in general, though, we are going to move into a world where, again, this, the cost of producing content 
it's going to be next to none, right? And so a lot of the problems we've seen with misinformation, disinformation today, of course, is just text, right? Someone tweets out something, which obviously doesn't get fact-checked, and a lot of people believe it, and it becomes almost true because there's so many people that believe it, right? In the future, you, you, we have to imagine that the people who wrote that tweet, they're going to be able to create a very convincing fake image or a very convincing fake video. That could be deep fake. I think usually it's... People think of that as taking someone's likeness and making a video of you saying something you didn't say. That's one risk. The other risk is just that you create a news anchor who's not real, but it looks like they're sitting in a studio. It looks like something you would see on CNN or whatever uh, cable news that people watch. On a, on a Wall Street Journal site, yeah. Exactly. And to do that today would be very expensive, right? You actually have to get a studio, a broadcasting camera, a talent in, but that's going to be very easy for people to do. So I think we're going to move into a world where you cannot believe everything you see in video, just like you can't believe everything you see in images, and you can't believe everything you read on the internet, right? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a big educational curve we have to get on as a society to, for people to realize that, um, that this is going to be what the future looks like, right? Yeah. At the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones and, and many media organizations, high-quality media organizations, we look at the, the equation of the information ecosystem by, by inserting reliable information into that trusted ecosystem, often also fact-checking misinformation that's out there, that's an important role and an increasingly important role uh, for us. Obviously, that's going to expand beyond text yeah. uh, uh, for us. Um, but uh, y when you look at that, you have a responsibility at, at your company to make sure that the, the avatars that go out don't do uh, anything of the sort. And my understanding is that you have a, a KYC process, like know, know your customer uh, process, where it's, it's not as easy as just typing in anything you want and disseminate something that is maybe uh, nefarious. How does yeah, that work? So, so we, we, um, our philosophy is, and I think what's, what we're going to see shifting with a lot of these AI products that are coming out now, is that traditionally we've thought of content moderation as something that happens at the point of distribution, right? Um, so in Microsoft Word, you could write the most horrible, vile things. You could make a PowerPoint presentation about committing genocide. We don't put the onus on Microsoft to, um, to not allow you to create that content, right? It's when you upload that content on the internet somewhere, YouTube, Facebook, whatever, that that content gets flagged and gets taken down. But we don't prohibit the creation of the content. What's happening with AI tools, and that's also the approach we're taking, is we're actually moving that back to the point of creation. So in Synthesia, if you go in and you write a script that says something really horrible, it'll go through our content moderation systems, and you'll not be able to create that content. Um, and this is actually, I think, quite a big paradigm shift that we're going to see. It comes with a lot of interesting nuances around freedom of speech and you know, us essentially being the arbiter of what we deem to be OK or not OK. We're a business platform, so most of our customers don't create anything that's kind of controversial. Um, but that's the sort of approach that we've taken. And we've taken a, what I would say is a, a fairly strict approach in terms of what kind of content you're allowed to create. You're obviously not allowed to create hate speech and the things that everyone in this room would agree is bad. But we also take a stance on news content where you have to be an enterprise customer. We need to know who you are and what your motivations are if you create uh, content about current events. Gambling, for example, is, is of course legal in most places in the world, but we don't think it's, it's great for the world that you can create AI avatar content around that yet. So, so in, in closing, um, what, what do you think the, your, your technology uh, will do for the future of news? I think we'll make news much, much more accessible to everyone in the population because you're going to be able to consume content in the format that you like. Some people prefer reading. I'm an avid reader myself. A lot of people prefer watching short form video content to get updated on current events. And I think this will be the technology that really harmonizes that so that someone who is 18 years old and mostly watches TikTok will also be able to get the TikTok version of a fantastic, well-reported piece that's been done in the Wall Street Journal. Okay, good. Well, uh, Victor, thank you so much for your perspective. Uh, I would encourage everybody to, uh, as we get our arms around new technology, to, of course, play with it, and, and there are plenty of opportunities to, yeah. uh, to do that uh, on your site. You can do it for free on our, on our website, synthesia.io. Okay, good. And with that, uh, thank you, Victor, and thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.